So in section 4.1, we introduce exponential functions by looking at this formula for calculating compound interest. And I always like to look at this formula reflecting back to an old movie called Trading Places. And they had a standard bet of $1. I thought, well, what would it be like to have $1 getting 100% interest for one year? What's going to happen? Well, if you think about this formula here, then the only thing that's not equal to 1 would be n. What does n represent in this formula? Remember? For calculating simple interest here. n is the number of year, number of times a year that interest is compounded. So for instance, we could start out with n equal 1. <clears throat> n equal 1, you invest your dollar January 1st. At the end of the year, you get 100% interest on that dollar. 100% of a dollar is a dollar. Add that to your account, you've got $2. So that's what would happen if you put in everything equal to 1. Um, actually, uh, where'd it go? Is that supposed to be an N or an R in the chart? N. Okay. So 1 plus 1 over N to the N power. That's essentially what's left here. Now, if I put in an N equal 2, what's happening is that you invest your dollar January 1st. Halfway through the year, July 1st, they give you 50% of your interest. 50% of a dollar is 50 cents. Add the to your account, you've got $1.50. Okay. Now, at the end of the year, December 31st, they give you the other 50% of your interest. But now you've got $1.50 in your account. So what's 50% of $1.50? Okay, you can take out your calculator if you need to. <laughs> what's half of $1.50? 75 cents. Yeah, 75 cents. Add that to your $1.50. Now you've got $2.25. Of course, this game is going to get a little bit tougher if we put in other things like n equal 4, n equal 12, n equal 360. So let's not play this game with a graph um, in our heads. Let's try and do it on our graphic calculator. So let me clear out this. And I think I have the function already programmed in here. Actually, I've got a lot of stuff programmed here. And no, I don't have it programmed in here. So let's put it in now. So I'm going to put in 1 plus 1 divided by x raised to the x power. And that's going to be my sort of pretty silly example of calculating interest compounded so many times a year. And we'll see what happens when I compound in different periods, different rates. So with that formula in there, let me go to my table function. Now, quick look at the table setup. Keep your independent set to ask, dependent set to auto. Go to your table. Let's delete everything there. I only want to look at the first column. These other two columns I probably should have shut off. In fact, I will shut those off. Let's go down here. If you press the Enter key on that equation, it'll turn it off. Like here, right now, that's solid. If I press enter, now it's turned off. So the only thing I should get now is y1. There we go. If we compound interest once a year, that gives us $2. Twice a year, $2.25. Four times a year, that's quarterly. Now I'm going to get back $2.44. So this is a nice game, right? You compound more often, you get more money back. Okay. Let's really start bumping it up. Bump it up to 12. Now you get $2.61 back. Okay, looking good there. 261. And let's go up to what the banks consider daily interest, which is 360. And type in a 360. Now you get 271 back. 2.71. But there's something odd happening here. It feels like we're slowing down. 
You went from one to two, you got an extra quarter. You went from two to four, you got an extra 19 cents. Four to 12, you got an extra 17 cents, but 12 to 360, you only get an extra dime. Now, taking this to the extreme with calculus, you can effectively put in infinity. And that's getting interest every second, of every hour, of every day of the year. Continuously compounded interest. It's always compounding. And that number would be 2.714 or 2718281, etc. Wow. So it kind of slows down. And if you look at the graph of that, you'll see that same thing here. So let me see if I can't pull up the graph here for us. Uh, let's go up to the top. So that's this one right here. And if you look, after a while, you can compound more and more, but you're not getting really substantial gains in terms of the number of how much interest you get. Uh, there. So you kind of follow it out, and it gets closer and closer to this strange number that we kind of arrived at empirically here. And that number is called E. And now you can get E off your calculator in a couple places. Let me show you where those are. If you just want the number E itself, let me back out of this, clear this out. If you just want the number E by itself, you hit the second key and then the division key, and that gives you E. Okay, there's E. So the only other mathematical constant that that's more important than that one would be pi. Pi is another number that never repeats and never ends. Uh, they're both really, really special numbers. And there's properties about E that I can't describe to you until we get to calculus, but it's got a lot of really cool properties. Now for us, E is gonna be the basis of uh, the natural logarithm. It's also gonna allow us to calculate continuously compounded interest. So it's gonna have a lot of applications. Um, <clears throat> Let's try and get comfortable with e in another way. For instance, I could do e squared a couple ways. I could hit the second key and then hit the ln key and do e to the second power. Yay, okay. So we get various powers of e. And let's turn our attention to the handout in which they ask us to do, um, evaluate the function e to the negative two x. So, quick look at the handout, e to the negative 2x, we want to find uh, that evaluated at 1 third, 1 1.5, negative 1, and negative pi. Probably the most efficient way to do that is to plug that into your graphing calculator. So, let's do that. Second ln to the negative 2x. And now we'll go to the table function and plug in those values. First thing I'll do is I'll just delete all the old stuff. I don't want to look at the old stuff. I want to type in numbers like 1 divided by 3, 1.5, negative 1, and negative pi. Negative pi should be pretty big. There you go. Now, presumably, WebAssign or something else is going to be asking you to round to certain digits. So let's round to the nearest thousandth place. So the first one would be point zero, or 0 0.513. Second would be 0 0.04. Eh, let's see. That's actually kind of a nice example here. What would this be? And let me come up here. What would this be if I rounded it to the nearest thousandth place. What should I write? For the second one. So where I'm highlighted right now at 1.5, what should that be rounded to the nearest thousandth place? Eddie? Zero, five, zero. That's All right. Great minds think alike, point zero, five, zero. Yeah, absolutely. Now, even though you get that, that one's going to round everything up, you still have to have a zero here because you're rounding to the nearest thousandth place. So there has to be a character there, a digit, 
whether it's zero or not doesn't matter. Then 7.389, 7.389, and the last one is 535 point something, but it doesn't look like it's giving us enough digits. So if you need those more digits, put the cursor on that, and on the bottom row of your calculator, it'll give you as many digits as you could want. And so Noah, how would I round this to the nearest thousand place? Um. What would that be? So. What should I round it to if I'm rounding to the nearest thousandth place? Some help? Two right. Yeah. So 535.492. Beautiful. So overall, your numbers should look like this for that first one. And all I'm trying to do here is get you comfortable and familiar with the function of E. It's an amazing function. And one of the things I told you about E a while ago is that it makes appearances in The Simpsons because they, the writers liked a lot about math. So let's play around with a couple of the very important natural constants in math. There's E, which is about 2.718218, etc. And then there's pi which is about 3.14159265359, etc. What do you think the record is for memorizing digits of pi? How many digits could somebody hold in their head at one time? 300, 70,000. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's kind of insane. Now, I want you to take out your calculator. And we're going to put these two together along with i, which is the square root of negative 1, and type in e to the i pi. And see what you get out of that. What does e to the i pi give you? And if you can't remember where i is, let me help you out. Um, clear this, clear this. So I want e, which is second, and then e to the x. i is right above the decimal point, so second and then decimal point and then pi is second and then the up arrow key e to the i pi what do you get when you type that out negative one yeah negative one so interestingly enough let me do that again what if i typed in e to the i pi plus one now what should i get zero which is just amazing. Now, if you take me for Calc 2, I can actually prove to you why this is true. But for now, we'll just accept it. But that, to a mathematician, that's a really sexy equation. You've got the five most important constants of math all wrapped up in one nice, neat formula. And it's just bizarre to think about that. This is a transcendental number. It has it's not the roots of any polynomial, same with this one. They never repeat, they never end, and somehow it all balances out. And you've got the five most important constants of math in one nice little number there. Just too cool. In fact, if you look at an episode of The Simpsons, Money Bart, Lisa's studying to be manager of a baseball team, and one of the books is E to the I pi plus one equals zero. So yeah, there's just a lot of that freeze frame gag math tucked into the Simpsons. So anyways, pretty cool, pretty cool. Now the important thing to note about E is that it's, you know, it's between two and three, a little bit closer to three, of course. <clears throat> so let's look at the graphs and remind ourselves some things about the graphs of our exponential functions. So, mm -hmm. let's see, uh, let me just, draw myself a quick graph. There was three features of the graph of an exponential function that I wanted you to know. Let's see if we can name all three. So, um, one, two, and three. What are those three features? Name one of them, any of them. Mm 
Nice. So that's the second one. It passes through 0, 1. Beautiful. Now, the other day when introducing the exponential functions, I showed you various pictures of just where you'd have to go to graph 2 to the x. And the point of that was to show you that it grows quickly. So it grows quickly. It passes through 0, 1. And what's going on over here? What's going on with that third one? The 3 is the asymptote. It never touches 0. Yes. Good. It gets close to, but never touches. Y equals 0 is an asymptote. So those are the three things you should know about the graph of an exponential function in general. Now that's assuming that we have y equals b to the x and that b is greater than 1. Okay, so those are your three features. Are you seeing those three features down here in example c? Hmm. Well, you've got the graph of e to the x. 2 to the x, and 3 to the x. Well, kind of looks like they're all passing through 0, 1. So that's good. Uh, they're growing quickly. Yeah, that's true. Now, e to the x is growing faster than 2 to the x, but not quite as fast as 3 to the x. So it's in between there a little bit. That makes sense. And all of them are getting closer and closer to y equals 0. All right. Looking good. Let's use this graph here to come up with a graph of 2 to the x, or 2 plus e to the x, I should say. What's going to happen when I look at that graph? How is it going to be shifted compared to the graph of e to the x? Left, right, up, or down? Up. Up. Up by 2. All right, so. Now, there's a couple things that get shifted up by 2. One of them is going to be my horizontal asymptote. But the other one is going to be this point. The point that was at 0, 1. Where is it going to be now for my new graph? Yeah, at 0, 3. It got shifted up by 2, just like everything else. And now, instead of y equals 0, I'm going to have a line at y equal 2. And that's going to be my new horizontal asymptote. So y equals 0 and y equals 2. Last but not least, i got to take this curve and kind of draw it, shift it up a little bit. Now, I'm not going to be taking out a microscope and looking to see if yours is 100% accurate, but I would like to see a reasonable looking graph. So let me see what I can do here. Your graph should never quite touch that line. Now, if you accidentally touch it a little bit, I'm not going to take off points, but where I will take off points, if you treat it like a, a billiard ball on a pool table and you ricochet off of this, that's wrong. All right. If you touch it a little bit, I don't care. Just make sure that you just try and get close to it and don't bounce back off. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Um, let's see if we can't figure out the domain and range for this function. So let's do that. The domain and the range. Now the domain is your x values. So where are the x values for this? What do I have graphed here for that function in black? Negative infinity to positive infinity. Yep. Negative infinity to positive infinity. Excellent. Now your y values go from lowest to highest. What's the lowest that these get to? Two. Two. Now I got a good question for you. Should I write that two with a parenthesis or a bracket? Parenthesis, hard parenthesis. Parenthesis. <laughs> a parenthesis, good. Nice. 
and it goes all the way up to what? Infinity. Infinity. Excellent. So there's your domain and range. Nice. We're going to play that same game with a couple other functions down here. But are we good with our first pass at this? Let's try some more here. Uh, you know, for something like this, I'd probably start by rewriting it. I'm not really a huge fan of the way they, they wrote it here for us. So let me turn it around a little bit as y equals negative e to the x plus 5. And all I did was I just switched things around. And let's see what each of these little things is going to do compared to the graph of e to the x. Why don't you think about it for a second while I pull up this graph on Desmos. So I'll shut this one off and we'll look first at the graph of e to the x. And we'll take a look at a couple other graphs too. What's the negative going to do to the graph? If I was just looking at the graph of e to the x versus the graph of negative of e to the x. Nick? Reflect it. Yeah, it's going to reflect it around the x-axis. So uh, flip around the x-axis. Beautiful. Robert, what do you think the plus 5 is going to do? Go up by 5. Yep. Shift up by 5. Thank you, sir. Let's see that in action. And I kind of like to do these things one at a time so that we can see that. Here's your graph of e to the x. If I look at the graph of negative e to the x, it's reflected around the x-axis. It's facing down now. Let's shut off this graph. The next step is to shift that up by 5. So we've got y equals 0 is still our horizontal asymptote, but when I shift it up by 5, well, now my horizontal asymptote is at y equal 5. So, great. The one point that I care about you keeping track of, this one at 0, 1, got reflected down here to 0, negative 1, and then shifted up by 5. So that one point that I'm going to look for on your graph is going to be at 0, 4. And if you take a look here, it's already sketched in for us. It's at 0, 4. So, beautiful. Let's see. What's the horizontal asymptote for my new graph here? Y equals 5. Yep, y equals 5. Let's sketch that in. And then try and draw our function. Something like that. Okay. That's cool. Let's work on the domain and range here. Domain and range. In fact, why don't you take a moment and try and decide the domain and range? What's the domain and range of that graph? My folks on Zoom can type in an answer in the chat. And my folks here can turn to a neighbor, see if you agree. Do you agree with your assessment of the domain and range? Do you have the parentheses right? Do you have from lowest to highest or left to right? Do you have those correct? <laughs> Thank you. 
Alright. Alright, so Okay. Thanks, Reagan. <laughs> Nick, did you get to check yourself? Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay. Jacqueline, did you get to check yourself? Uh, I did it for the one. Okay. All right, so what do we got for the domain? Negative infinity to infinity. Excellent. How about the range? Negative infinity to 5 and a parenthesis on that one because it never actually quite touches 5. So, great, great. Are we good with that first one here? Let's look at the second one. So, let me kind of mark between these two and let's look at uh, y equals e to the negative x minus 1. So again, you're going to get some shifting around here. This time, instead of putting a negative in front of the e to the x term, I've got a negative in the x. So e to the negative x. What kind of, what kind of change is that going to make to the graph if I just looked at that much? Flipped around the y-axis. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Flip it around the y-axis. Uh, let me shut off this. Turn back on this. Here it is flipped around the y-axis. Now my point at 0, 1 is still at 0, 1. Okay. What's the equation of my asymptote for this graph in blue? Where is the graph in blue? What's the asymptote here? What's it getting close to? Y equals 0. And so if I subtract 1, I should have a new asymptote at y equal negative 1. And the point that was at 0, 1 is now going to be at the origin. So, okay. Let's draw ourselves a nice horizontal asymptote. And let's see. I'll do this one in green. And again, you want to have a nice smooth function getting closer and closer to, but not quite touching this line. <clears throat> so something roughly like that. And I'm looking for basic shapes here. I'm not looking for, you know, exact perfection. If I wanted that, I'd be doing it on a graphing calculator or Desmos. So uh, this got reflected around uh, the x-axis, or excuse me, the y-axis, and then down by 1. We can do our domain and range again. The domain you know, for these exponential functions is pretty much always going to be negative infinity to infinity. What's the other notation that I use for negative infinity to infinity? Script R. Script R. Nice. All real numbers. And finally, the range. Sean, what would the range be, please? Uh, negative 1 to infinity. Nice. Negative 1 to infinity. Negative 1 and infinity both get a parenthesis. Well done. All right. How are we looking on that one? Doing all right. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's keep on working with exponential functions. So, flipping over our handout to example D. So we've got this new function. It's not quite an exponential function. Um, I'm trying to think. It's, it's not quite a... Sometimes there's things called hyperpowers. This is not quite a hyperpower, but it's um, 3 times x to the x power. 
for values of x that are greater than zero. Now it's going to want you to find the local minimum and local maximum values. Now if it's asking for a local minimum, local maximum, it's asking for the y coordinate. So make sure you're careful about putting that in to WebAssign as the y coordinate and that you round it to the proper number of decimal places. They want two decimal places. Quite often on an exam, I'll ask you to round it to a certain number of decimal places. And oftentimes, that will be worth a point of extra credit, or a point of credit, I should say. Now, a lot of you could probably use a reminder or refresher of how to do this on the graphing calculator, so I will do it here. It's really easy on decimals. I'm going to shut off this graph. And since we want to look at this graph for x greater than 0, I'll oblige. I'm going to set up my window from, say, 0 to, eh, I'll just go 3.5. That should be good enough. Y minimum, you could put 0. I'll put negative 3 because it's there. And let me go up to 20. And I'm going to put tick marks every two units. I don't want them every unit because then my y-axis would get a little too crowded. I could put x scale to 1. be a little bit easier to see there. When you get this set up, hit the graph key. And it's not graphing because I forgot to turn it on. All right, so let me go back here, turn that on, and now hit the graph key. There you go. So you get something like that. And this graph is just going to keep going up and up and up. It's just going to grow incredibly fast, even faster than our exponential functions. Might not be a bad idea to zoom in a little bit. Maybe this portion right here. I'll give you a quick reminder. You can do that with zoom box. So zoom and then the first one. And let me zoom in to say this portion of the graph starting here. I'll move down and then to the left. So that's my new viewing window and it should give me a better looking graph. I think I can easily see that there's a minimum someplace around here. To find that minimum, you're going to use the calculate menu. So to get there, you hit the second key, then the trace key. You want to find a minimum. And it's saying, all right, well, what's the left bound? So choose something comfortably to the left of wherever the minimum is. In this case, eh, a zero will work. Now for the right bound, you can again type in a number like one, or you can cursor there. Your calculator doesn't care which one you do, just as long as you give it an interval upon which to look for a minimum. You press enter once you have your right bound, and then it's going to ask you for an initial guess. Just press enter again. Now, let's see who's paying attention. Which coordinate do I want here? The y coordinate. The y coordinate. All right, so that's my local minimum. If I round that to the nearest thousandth place, they wanted two decimal places, so I'm going to go three. Um, the nearest thousandth, what would that be? 2.077. Of course, this procedure is a lot easier on Desmos. I mean, a lot easier. It's just laughably easy. Here's the function. If you want that minimum point, you just click the graph. There it is. Wow. Doesn't get much easier than that. 2.077. Nice. Of course, if you want more than three digits, then, then that's not going to work for us. <clears throat> okay, great. Now there is no local maximum, so you would enter D and E for there. I mean, I guess you could consider three a local maximum. Yeah, I don't know. I go back and forth in my mind as to whether or not I consider three a local maximum. I'd cut you some slack on that. Um, um, if you put three on a test, yeah, I'd, I'd take that. Um, personally, I guess I, I don't think of that as a local maximum, but I know a lot of authors disagree with me, and that's fine. 
<clears throat> Let's move on down to example E. Skydiver, skydiver jumps from a reasonable height above the ground. The air resistance she experiences, proportional velocity, yada, yada, yada. Um, it can be shown that the down velocity of the skydiver is given by this formula where t is measured in seconds and v of t is measured in feet per second. So the formula that we get here is v of t equals 180 times 1 minus e to the negative 0.015 or negative 0 0.15 times t. So we're going to have to evaluate this at three different values of time to find, first of all, the initial velocity, and then the velocity after four seconds, and the velocity after nine, 19 seconds. So, okay. Let's look at your job for our graphing calculator again. So take out your graphing calculator. Put in the function. Now, we're not going to use a t because for our purposes it's more convenient to use e, or excuse me, x, but there's your function. 180 times parenthesis 1 minus e to the negative 0.15x. So we'll type that in, and then we're going to have to evaluate it at different points. Hopefully you have your calculator set up the same way I do. Second, and then table set. Independent should be set to ask. Dependent should be set to auto. Let's go to our table and delete all this stuff here. Let's get rid of all that stuff. So I'm going to evaluate this at t equal 4, t equal 19. But what am I going to do to find the initial velocity? Um, how can I find the initial velocity? What should I put in for t? Zero. Excellent. So that's going to be t equals zero, t equals four, and t equals 19. Plug those into your calculator. You can actually do t equals zero in your head. You'd end up with e to the zero. What's e to the zero? One. So in the parentheses, you'd have one minus one, which is zero. Zero times 180, that's still zero. And if we type in a 0, we get a 0. If you type in a 4, we get 81 feet per second. And if you type in 19, you get 169.59 feet per second. That's fast. It's over 100 miles an hour. All right, so t equals 0, v equals 0. Then 81.2, and finally 169.6. Mm -hmm. All right, so basically just asking you, can you plug this into your calculator? and come up with some values. If you look at the function, its graph is kind of interesting and revealing. And let's see, do I have that one graphed here? Uh, no, I'll graph it here. Y equals 180 times one minus E to the negative 0 0.15 uh, times X. And let's see if I can't rein in that graph a little bit. It doesn't just, I mean, your graph does get, or your velocity does get faster and faster, but it's to a point. Eventually, you're kind of, you know, reaching a limit, and that limit is called your terminal velocity. In this case, that limit would be your 180. So let me see if I can't go out far enough to kind of show that. Yeah, eventually this is going to get close to, in fact, I'm, I'm close enough now that it shows my velocity being 180. That's the Y coordinate. And that's it. That's it. All we're looking for here.
Let's go back to example F, or let's work example F. Try and figure out how this graph has been shifted compared to y equals e to the x. How has it been translated, shifted? I'll give you a hint. There's a total of three things that are happening to that graph. While you're doing that, I'll set up some visuals for that. <clears throat> Let's start out with the, the negative out front. What happens with that negative out in front? What's it going to do to our graph? Awesome, thank you. Flips around the x-axis. Nice. Someone else. Julian, what about that negative x in the exponent? Flipped over the y-axis. Perfect. Flipped around the y-axis. And last but not least, Plus three. Perfect. Shift up by three. Nice. Let's see all these things happen and see what happens to the graph. <clears throat> so we'll start out with the graph of e to the x. And first thing that's going to happen is we're going to reflect it around the x-axis. Great. So let's stop thinking about this one. Let's think about this one. The next thing that's going to happen is I'm going to flip around the y-axis. So my point that was here is now going to be at 0, negative 1. Okay, no big deal. Let's keep track of that point, though. If I flip that around the y-axis, well, that point is still there, still at 0, negative 1, except now I've got an increasing function as opposed to a decreasing function. What's the horizontal asymptote at this moment? y equals 0. Thank you. Last but not least, I'm going to add 3 to this graph. So the point that was here at 0, negative 1 is now at 0 and 2. And the function is getting closer and closer to this line. What's the equation of that line? y equals how many? 3. 3. Thank you. So closer and closer to y equals 3. Let's sketch that. I've got a point here on my graph at 0, 2. And if I were to redo this graph, I would because I wasted a lot of space up above. So something roughly like that. Got an increasing function, and then it kind of caps out closer and closer to y equals 3. Our domain is all real numbers. What's the range? Negative infinity to two. Negative infinity to two. Uh, pardon me, three. Nice. All right, are we okay with example F? We got one more like that, and then uh, another application problem for exponential function. Exponential functions come, over, come through a lot of places, in part because this that value solves a lot of differential equations, uh, very common ones. It's also part of Newton's law of cooling, amongst a lot else. Well, let's work with example G. Again, you've got a function that's shifted. I've got two shifts in this graph. Rebecca, um, 
what's the minus 2 going to do to my graph? How's it going to shift? Up, down, left, or right? How's it going to shift? Down. Down 2. Nice. Down 2. And then the minus 3 in the exponent? Um, by 3. To the right by 3. Now, my initial graph of y equals e to the x passes through the point 0, 1. If I shift that point to the right 3 and down 2, what are, be, what are going to be the coordinates of that point on my new graph? 3, 1, negative 1. Negative 1. Three common negative one to the right by three, down by two, three common negative one. And I think you can see the domain and range here. The domain, this is getting kind of monotonous, that's all real numbers. The range, range here we gotta think about a little bit. Range is gonna be negative two to infinity. And the equation of the asymptote. Good question. What's the equation of the asymptote? Nice. Y equals negative 2. Beautiful. <clears throat> okay. So the last example goes back to um, some of the early times in the nuclear industry. And it's been since the 1940s that we were getting nuclear power, uh, which has its benefits because it's carbon neutral. But one of the problems with nuclear power is that uh, you've got all this radioactive waste that you have to deal with. So from the 1940s to, the to 1970, they would take these big 55-gallon drums full of radioactive waste out to the Farallon Islands east or west of... San Francisco and just dump them in the ocean. And if the barrels didn't sink, the Navy would riddle the barrels with machine gun bullets until enough water came in and plutonium and cesium came out until they sunk. And they've been sitting at the bottom near the Farallon Islands for, you know, 70 plus years now. So the question is how much radioactivity would be left? And I guess it's going to depend on how long you've been waiting. There's a little typo in this. That should be zero, negative 0 0.023 T. I left off at zero. So annoyed. Okay. Let's find out how much cesium-137 will be left in a 10, 10 kilogram sample after, well, let's see, a lot of you are 18 years old. So let's find P of 18. And then how much is left after 76 years, which is about how long some of the oldest barrels are down there. So plug this formula into your graphing calculator or into Desmos. Let me show you slash remind you that you can do these things in Desmos as well. So I'll shut these off. You don't have to use Desmos just for graphing. You can use them you use it as a graphing calculator. So I'll call this P of T equals 10 E to the negative 0.023 T. And then I can do P of whatever I want. P of 18. P of 76. <clears throat> Are you getting the same numbers as I am? That after 18 years, there's still 6.6 .6 pounds of cesium left. And even after 76 years, there's still a couple pounds of that left. Well, 1.74 pounds to be more, more precise, but. Okay. Uh, are you able to get those numbers? All right.
Good, good, good. All right, that'll call it a, call it a day on section 4.2.